Great. Welcome. This is Professor Guerra Pujol, and welcome to the University of Central Florida. Um, what I am recording is a class on face mash and sources of law. Um, let's begin by looking at a film clip that um, depicts the face mash incident as it occurred at Harvard in the fall of 2003. By way of background, I want to just give you some background information so you can appreciate the backstory behind the film clip. Um, Harvard College is divided into a number of residential houses. I believe there's 12 residential houses. There may be 13, one for non-traditional students, but there's a, a number, at least 12 residential houses for the college students. What happens at Harvard, if you are lucky enough, you know, if you apply to Harvard and you're lucky enough to get accepted, um, your first year at Harvard College, you will live in Harvard Yard. And Harvard Yard is, um, you know, if you're ever in the Boston area, you can take the green line, the T, um, all the way to, uh, you know, from Metro Boston into Cambridge, Massachusetts, get off at the Harvard Yard station and um, walk across the street to Harvard Yard. Now, after your freshman year, um, all Harvard College students are assigned into one of these 12 residential houses and um, uh, beginning your sophomore year. And that's where you're going to live. Um, that's where you're going to live until you graduate your senior year. So you can imagine Harvard, you know, um, your cafeteria, you know, not just your living quarters and your suite mates, you know, your designated roommates, but your cafeteria, the rec room, gym facilities, um, social activities, et cetera, will be centered around your residential house. Mark Zuckerberg, for example, was assigned to the Kirkland house. Uh, I think there's a um, Adams house, you know, there's 12 houses altogether, uh, plus one for non-traditional students. And at the time in 2003, each of these residential houses had its own website. Some of them were password protected. So only students assigned to that house could access their house website. Others, you know, if you knew the website address, you could go ahead and access the, uh, the website. Now, each of the websites of the residential houses had its own quote unquote Facebook. This is really, really important because this will likely be an inspiration for the Facebook as it was called when it was launched. Actually, exactly, exactly um, uh, 16 years ago, 16 years and two days ago, February 4th, 2004. Um, if I do, no, 19 years, sorry, if I do my math correct, my, my basic arithmetic. So it'll be the 20, 20 year anniversary will be next year of the launching of the Facebook. Um, but back, back before Zuckerberg launched his own website, what happened was each website had an electronic Facebook, which consisted of, it's called a Facebook because what it was, it was an electronic directory of the pictures, names and majors of all of your students, fellow students in each residential house. Um, now, the problem is at the time there wasn't a universal Facebook at Harvard. So like if you were like Zuckerberg and you lived in the Kirkland house and you wanted to look up a fellow student who lived in a different dorm in a different house, you know, if their house was password protected, you know, um, it wasn't gonna be easy. Um, you, you know, you'd have to ask to borrow a friend's password, for example, or um, if it wasn't password protected, then you could look up, but it was a totally non-interactive. It was just a, a, a photo directory, you know, of each student's photo ID um, would be posted on the Facebook page, you know, which was just like I said, a photo directory, which would include your picture, your headshot, you know, as an entering student at Harvard your name, major, and I believe your hometown, or, you know, where you, uh, where you came from, um, uh, maybe even your high school information. Uh, and so what Zuckerberg is going to do when he creates face mash is he is going to, you know, uh, literally hack uh, uh, the computer databases of nine of the 12 residential houses in order to amass uh, basically a uh, whole bunch of uh, student ID photos and create his own website that he's going to call Face Mash. Now, the controversy with the social network is how accurate is it? You know, is it a Hollywood, you know, like most Hollywood productions, how, you know, how much is truth, how much is exaggeration, and how much is outright falsity? I just want to say for the record, the reason why I'm showing you this film clip 
is because that I'm about to show you is that Jesse Eisenberg's voiceover, the actor who plays Mark Zuckerberg, is word for word taken from the real Mark Zuckerberg's own blog at the time. The one change is the name of the student he refers to. To protect that student, the student he was dating, this is the famous opening scene in the social network of Erica Albright. We don't know who her real name is. That's the one detail that's changed that the producers of the movie said, let's not use the person's real name. Let's make up a name, but everything else is gonna be word for word from the blog. All right, so let's, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and do a screen share and show you the film clip. After the film, um, if you haven't done so, take the survey. I've posted the link in the uh, chat of the Zoom uh, if you're watching this live. And um, uh, I say that because I'll be posting a recording um, and uh, then we'll go over those survey results. Erica Albright's a bitch. Do you think that's because her family changed their name from Albrecht? Or do you think it's because all the you girls are bitches? For the record, she may look like a 34C, but she's getting all kinds of help from our friends at Victoria's Secret. She's a 34B, as in barely anything there. False advertising. The truth is, she has a nice face. I need to do something to take my mind off her. Easy enough, except I need an idea. I'm a little intoxicated, I'm not gonna lie. So what if it's not even 10 p.m. and it's a Tuesday night? The Kirkland Facebook is open on my desktop and some of these people have pretty horrendous Facebook pics. Oh no. Billy Olson's sitting here and had the idea of putting some of the pictures next to pictures of farm animals and have people vote on who's hotter. Good call, Mr. Olson. I'm not going to do the farm animals, but I like the idea of comparing two people together. It gives the whole thing a very Turing feel, since people's ratings of the pictures will be more implicit than, say, choosing a number to represent each person's hotness like they do on hotornot.com. First thing we're going to need is a lot of pictures. Unfortunately, Harvard doesn't keep a public centralized Facebook, so I'm going to have to get all the images from the individual houses that people are in. Let the hacking begin. I'll stop there. I have a link to the entire, I'll put the link uh, to the video recording and um, on the homepage of the course, if you want to watch the entire scene, if you haven't seen the movie, The Social Network. Um, uh, uh, what I want to do is uh, now that you've seen, you know, that I paused it there on that part of the blog post, let the hacking begin. I think it's 1258 AM. And, you know, normally we could say, by way of cliche, famous last words, right? But in fact, you know, what's kind of ironic is uh, we could say here famous first words. If you go on your, um, uh, on your, um, if you have an Apple phone, you know, uh, 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 iPhone, you know, your uh, uh, map function, or you have Android, Google Maps, and you type in one hacker way, what you're gonna get is the address of the headquarters of Meta Inc., the company that owns Facebook and Instagram, WhatsApp, and is you know developing the metaverse. Um, so um, uh, there's a sort of a close affinity between you know this hacker spirit and um, um, and the origins of Facebook in in the face mash. 
Uh, also, um, I will say that, you know, hacking, one of the reasons why I find this uh, clip so mesmerizing is not just the great, you know, uh, cinematic work here, um, but also, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important problem in the legal environment today. You know, any business that has uh, data, you know, uh, um, on, on servers, you know, is, ex is potentially, you know, is exposed to this hacking threat. So what I want to look at is, um, you know, how do we determine whether the face mash is an illegal website or not? How do we determine the legal consequences? And, um, and I, you know, I'll focus on face mash. We could use any number of examples. I remember when I began teaching at UCF in 2014, I believe the very next semester, um, uh, UCF, uh, a lot of data was hacked, you know, and UCF had to make this whole big uh, announcement and take, you know, some uh, security measures. I know, um, you know, a number of, you know, uh, uh, um, Equifax, you know, and a lot of the credit uh, reporting agencies have been hacked. Um, you know, Florida Advent Ho Hospital um, has been hacked. Uh, you know, Home Depot, you know, Target, you, you name the company, even the US government, you know, um, uh, data has been hacked uh, by uh, foreign entities and domestic as well. So it's a really serious problem. So what I'll do is um, I'm going to go ahead and screen share and what I'll do are the results of the survey. Um, and what I'll do is I'm going to merge those results with um, uh, since this recording is from the honor section, I want to merge it with the entire, you know, uh, five uh, ordinary regular sections, uh, so that you can see what your fellow classmates, you know, uh, what they think about, um, uh, you know, what they think about the questions that are on the survey, and then I'll use those survey results to drill down on the main sources of law. This is important because. When we identify, you know, when we when we say the rule of law is an important value, you know, that's premise that there is law that we can look up what the law is, that we can know ahead of time when our behavior poses a potential legal risk, potential uh, risk of legal liability, either civil or criminal. So that's why I, I want to do this as a way of illustrating with a specific example. So let's go ahead and do a screen share in here and uh, pull up. The survey results. Let me just uh, get out of this one. Sorry, my system is, you know, I'm not, uh, let's see, where are my survey results? I believe it's this tab. All right, hopefully, um, hopefully we're seeing the, uh, I'll go to survey statistics. Um, let me know in the chat if uh, you're not able to see the survey results on, um, on the screen share. Let's let that load. Uh, all right, I think, yeah, it's still loading. All right, here we go. All right, let's break this down. My first question is, um, and this is just by way of background, I was always curious to know um, what, is, what the student's favorite social media platform uh, is. And, and this is, a, I, I will admit, it's a tough question because um, the reality is, you know, probably using multiple websites, um, you know, multiple social media platforms. But, you know, if you had to pick one, what's your favorite? you know, your go-to, if you will. And um, if we look at the results here, and notice I didn't include all of these in here, uh, but um, just to keep this manageable. Um, but um, again, these are the results of all five sections, plus my honor student. I wanted them to participate. I want them you, you to participate in here. And you'll see that, you know, what's really interesting is that um, the least popular is you know, no, it looks like we don't have any people blogging on the WordPress uh, uh, platform, uh, but once we get uh, uh, WordPress out of here, you know, Facebook is the least popular. The most popular, just in terms of uh, plurality, is going to be Instagram. And so, what's really interesting is that you know, Facebook owns both of those platforms. Um, uh, Facebook is something, as we'll see uh, uh, in a future class. Zuckerberg very likely stole the idea for Facebook, you know, um, uh, when he created that website. 
And then with Instagram, right, he bought out the rights, the, the legal rights, you know, the intellectual property rights to Instagram um, in, uh, uh, I believe it was uh, 2010. Um, but you see here some of the other popular, um, notice you have a, uh, for second place, we have, uh, it's really close here, a tie between TikTok, a statistical tie between TikTok and YouTube, very popular. You know, YouTube is very useful. TikTok is very entertaining. Um, um, and then notice you have like distant uh, uh, third, fourth, and fifth. You have some of these other ones that you probably consult, but maybe aren't as uh, as popular as as uh, uh, Instagram and TikTok and YouTube. All right. Now, the reason why I, I want to uh, want I begin with this question is that whichever one is your favorite, whichever one you use. And by the way, notice we have a few students that. Um, don't use social media at all, you know, um, out of the several hundred students in the uh, regular class. Uh, uh, so that's, you know, again, it's 1%. Uh, but, um, you know, I find that interesting. Um, but each of these, right, we want to know, like, if you, you know, if somebody hacks, you know, and each of these have had uh, hacking problems as well. Um, you know, what are the legal consequences? Um, and we'll see each of these websites have their own content moderation policies and their own community standards. So we'll talk about that because that's been in the news a lot. You know, um, are certain websites, for example, uh, certain platforms, are they being uh, selective in the way they enforce their content moderation policies? You know, are they in essence, you know, um, engaging in private censorship? Um, and to the extent it's been released with the Twitter files and even before the Twitter files, I believe it was the Intercept did a whole expose where the Department of Homeland Security or officials at the DHS have been in regular meetings with, uh, you know, executives at each of these social media platforms, um, asking them to, um, you know, be on the lookout for certain for certain posts. Uh, so, uh, th so there's issues of uh, sort of indirect censorship that I'll I'll uh, see how I can weave in here. Here, though, folk, let's focus on Face Smash because that's there. There's no dispute. What's interesting about Face Smash is that the website itself. It's one thing if you you know you're a victim of uh, hacking. You know, it's quite another thing where you know uh, as as Face Smash looks for all intents and purposes, right, to be an illegal website. So how would how does the class you know globally? How, what word would you use to describe face mesh? And um, if we look at these responses, um, we see that 10% um, would say it's an honor code violation. Um, we'll take a look at Harvard's honor code in just a moment. That's important because that's gonna reflect something called private ordering. When we talk about the rule of law, oftentimes private ordering, private contracts, private agreements, community standards, content moderation policies are often ignored. But to the extent the general rule is that contracts are enforced by the courts, you know, barring exceptions uh, that we'll take a look at when we look at the common law, you know, but the general rule is that, you know, contracts uh, that are voluntary um, are generally enforced. We'll look at the details right? Private ordering then sort of enters into the rule of law through the back door. Um, notice uh, some would say, describe it uh, as a hypothesis test or science experiment. Remember the thing about the face, face mash, the hypothesis to be tested is, right, who is the hottest person at, uh, 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 you know, at, uh, on campus and at Harvard at the time. And the thing about it is, I didn't show you the full film clip, but um, the movie shows, right, how, uh, you know, Eduardo Saverin jotting down the ELO chess ranking algorithm, uh, which is used to rank chess players. I believe the uh, uh, United States Tennis Association and other uh, sports bodies also use a form of the chess ranking algorithm in order to determine the ranking of uh, players. And um, so one could say to the, you know, without getting into the details, how the chess ranking algorithm works. Um, there's a reference to it in the film clip and on, on Zuckerberg's own blog that hot or not, right, um, there, um, that purports to tell you who the hottest person, you know, in the population of photos is. But um, the thing with hot or not, right, people are submitting their own photos. 
So, um, you know, how many of those photos are filtered, you know what I mean? Um, but number two is when people are assigning a rank, you know, anywhere from, and you know, I, I was never on Hot or Not website, but my understanding it's, you know, you could rank the lowest ranking you could give a picture would be a one and the highest ranking would be a 10. Um, and the issue there is that um, you'll get some idea, you know, if you have enough people, like in our survey here, we have, if you include the regular section, we have over 500 participants here. Um, you know, if you have a large number of participants, you'll get some rough idea who the hottest person is. Problem is, you know, um, beauty is one of these uh, one of these subjective values, you know what I mean? Um, although they're general contours of what beauty is, but, you know, people may have a different opinions about what, what constitutes a 10, for example. You know, with hot, with face mash, right? Because you have to pick, you're not assigning a numerical value to any of the pictures. You're just picking, there's two pictures that are put up at random and you're picking which of the two pictures is the hotter one, right? And the idea with the chess ranking algorithm is if enough people vote enough times, right? Once the two pick random pictures come up, right? One picture would have been voted more hotter than the other picture. And some of the pictures are going to be consistently be voted more hotter. And the thing about it is, I'll explain it with the chess, chess, um, the chess world, you know, Magnus Carlsen is right now the reigning, you know, three-time world champion of chess. If I have, if I play Magnus Carlsen and I somehow defeat him legitimately without cheating, um, my ELO ranking, my chess ranking is going to go up by you know, not dozens, maybe even over a hundred points just because I've defeated the world champion, you know, and I'm an unranked player. If Magnus Carlsen defeats me, which is the more likely outcome, right? His ranking will go up at most one or two points because he's defeated an unranked player. So uh, that's how, you know, uh, uh, that's how the ELO ranking algorithm uh, tries to give you a more accurate picture, you know, of, um, um, and, and so applying that, you could argue applying that to looks, you know, to discovering who the hottest student is, you could argue that is a novel, has some scientific value. Notice though, that's eluding the moral question is should we be ranking people based on their looks at all, right? Um, I will talk about separately, more, uh, you know, morality and ethics, um, but um, that's always the big thing. Whenever we um, enact a law, whenever we do conduct a scientific test, always in the background are questions of uh, ethics and morality. Now the third, um, the third would be a third uh, 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 most uh, voted here is a criminal act that this website is illegal and generates criminal liability. Um, we'll we'll take a look at that further. Um, in, in fact, that's probably that's probably right. Um, notice the fourth most selected answer here was a was just a college prank. You know, this is neither a moral issue nor a legal issue, just a prank. Um, and finally, the, the, an the answer choice that got the most um, support here, most votes, was that it's illegal, but on the civil side. It's a breach of a legal duty. The main difference there is that, and this is something we'll see uh, in a future class, uh, future module, um, difference between uh, criminal and civil liability, um, two different types of uh, legal procedures, two different types of cases. But broadly speaking, that's what you have. You have criminal and civil liability, you know, and then you have also possible private ordering, you know, like violating the honor code. Um, so let's let's here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. Um, let's look at let's continue with the survey and look at all the major sources of law and apply it to face mesh, you know, and just go through this and to show you that, you know, because what we really care about is rule of law that we can find that we can say, you know, either ahead of time or after the fact, as in the case of face mesh, that this is clearly illegal, clearly wrong, you know, or not. So let's see, let's see if we can do that. Um, next survey question. So let's focus first on private ordering. The reason why I always start with private ordering is because something that even if you're familiar with the legal environment in the United States, our federal system that we have states and the federal government, we have dual sovereigns, you know, plus we have an international law regime in the background. Um, most people forget about private ordering. And if you think about it, it's really the most important of our sources of law um, in that, you know, if you're a student, as you are, if you're watching the video, right, your university or college probably has an honor code, you know, or some kind of academic integrity policy. You know, if you're an employee, right, which most of us are 99%, you know, at some point we either 
already work or we're going to join the workforce after college, right? Your employer may have a code of conduct or a code of ethics, that kind of thing, right? And even if you're like, you know, the next Mark Zuckerberg, right? You want to create your own startup, right? Um, you're going to have to think, do you want to have, you know, what's your company's uh, private ordering going to be? What's your code of conduct is going to be? How are you going to handle po a potential problem in-house potential problems of sexual harassment. And you can see, right, um, a lot of these companies have these code of conduct, code of ethics, not, not just because they might be concerned that they want to signal how, you know, moral they are and how, you know, they, you know, uh, their commitment to ethical uh, values, you know, but also, right, to avoid potentially legal liability, right, you know, so uh, th that's why these things are so important. Um, now, uh, here, what I'm asking is, um, is the face smash, let's say it is an honor code violation. And I will tell you in real life, Zuckerberg was sent to the student conduct committee at Harvard. At Harvard, it's called the administrative board or the ad board. Um, uh, so, you know, um, and from what we can tell, Harvard, because it's a private college, you know, uh, there's no public record to their ad board proceedings. You know, we don't know what occurred. Uh, but it's most likely, though, Zuckerberg wasn't suspended or expelled. Um, he very likely may have been admonished, which means it's basically a warning. If you get ad boarded a second time, you are going to get at least suspended, you know, potentially even, you know, uh, dismissed from the university. So an admonishment serves as a kind of a warning, you know, your first strike, if you will. Um, now, the Harvard Honor Code, I know here it's small. Um, I wanted to give you uh, the version that was revised in 2014, which is a lot stronger. But if you look at it, you know, um, you're going to see that it's, well, let's see what the class thinks. You know, is this an honor code violation? Is face smash an honor code violation? And what's surprising here is that only 44% say no, uh, whereas 56% say yes. I say that's surprising. You know, you would think that's an honor code violation. I mean, you know, hacking a, a computer database, right? And then posting your fellow students' pictures without their consent. And then, you know, making it possible for other people to rank those students on their hotness, you know? That seems to be an egregious, you know, uh, a, a moral wrong and ethical uh, violation here. But, you know, uh, the honor code itself, right? If you really look at it, it's really focused on, you can see here on the title, academic integrity. You know, things like plagiarism, you know, cheating on an exam, getting somebody else to take an exam for you, for example, those kind of things. Um, there is some language about also in, you know, your interactions with your uh, peers and students, you know, other students. Uh, so maybe you can stretch out the meaning of the honor code, you know what I mean, to include an extracurricular project. Um, but what's really interesting here and what I really want to emphasize, because Let's go back to our first survey question. Um, all of these social media platforms that we use, uh, in order to use them, you're probably required to accept terms of use. Those terms of use, it's basically a contract. You know, it's private ordering. You agree to abide by the community standards or the content moderation policies of the platform. And if you don't, you can be sanctioned. You know, you could be kicked off the platform or your posts can be taken down. And like I say, generally, it's unreviewable in a court of law. That's why private ordering is so important. Now, let me just take a quick time out in the context of social media, right? There is a legitimate um, uh, legal policy dispute in that, you know, um, the general belief among scholars is that, you know, we have what's called a digital public square, you know, that these platforms are not just to exchange pictures about your, you know, cat, you know, baby pictures, things like that. Uh, but also, you know, pictures of you, you know, with a, a shot of tequila, whatever it is, you, you know, you post on the sites, you know, but th we also exchange information, you know, and uh, people, you know, um, support or um, uh, their favorite candidate, you know, or voice their opposition to other candidates, you know, in political parties. And so, um, because we use social media, not just for personal reasons, but also for political reasons, you know, to sh you know, talk about uh, political issues of the day, you know, um, there is this issue that maybe the content moderation policies need to be regulated, you know. Uh, now, that's a policy question, right? But, th but that's a big question that's being debated as we speak, you know, in the Congress. 
you know? And so we'll see what happens, you know, um, in the future. But I just want to throw that out there that the general rule is unless Congress or one of the states act. And by the way, I should say that states like Florida and Texas have enacted legislation regulating or attempting to regulate the content moderation policies of these, um, so, you know, of these social media platforms. And then the issue becomes, you know, um, uh, a free speech one. Because I'm going to talk about free speech at the end of the lecture, I'll come back to that topic. Because as you can see, this is something that there's no easy answer ahead of time. You know, it's something that we'll have to see how it plays out. You know, if the Congress gets in, enacts national legislation, preempting local legislation, you know, and if Congress does not act, both the Texas and the Florida social media regulation laws are right now, right now as I speak, you know, uh, uh, February 6, 2023, are being litigated in the courts. And so, um, um, and I believe the, the discussion is, you know, um, I, I, if, if I'm not mistaken, both the courts in Texas and Florida have enjoined temporarily enforcement of the Florida and Texas laws, you know, until there's a full hearing. So we'll see, you know, this is all this debate is going on in real time about, you know, the private ordering of these social media platforms and can the government regulate those. Normally, the general rule is, you know, uh, contracts are enforceable and they're off limits, right? But the trend is, of course, to have government regulation. Um, so uh, I just want to throw that out there, why this is so important and why I begin with private ordering. All right. Now, um, if you go back to our initial question, um, by the way, if I could take a time out, um, how did Zuckerberg himself describe uh, the face smash? It turns out that um, many years later, in April of 2018, Zuckerberg was invited to testify before Congress. Uh, you know, there was an implicit threat that he might be subpoenaed. This was back when there was something called the Cambridge Analytica data breach. And so there was this whole scandal that Facebook had not done enough to protect the data of Facebook users. And in fact, let me tell you, um, Facebook ended up um, agreeing to a settlement order with the Federal Trade Commission later that same year in 2018. And Facebook agreed to pay a record $5 billion Yes, you heard that correctly. That's $5,000 million to the Federal Trade Commission, you know, for not protecting, not doing enough to protect the data of its users, or in some cases, Facebook not living up to its own privacy commitments and its terms of use. Uh, so um, when Zuckerberg was called to testify while the FTC was doing its investigation and there was a public outcry, front story in the uh, front page story in the New York Times, you know, all this stuff going on. Um, a member of Congress actually asked Zuckerberg what was face mash. And so this is because this is the real life Zuckerberg. Let me just play this for you. And you can see for yourself, um, um, you know, if you find Zuckerberg to be a credible witness. Oh, hold on. Let me just uh, get the sound on. I think the default on Facebook. This is a clip from C-SPAN uh, from their uh, Facebook page it looks like uh so i'm gonna go ahead and okay now this should be working what was face smash and is it still up and running no congressman face smash was a, a prank website that i launched in college in my dorm room um, before I started Facebook, there was a movie about this, or it said it was about this. It was of uh, uh, unclear truth, um, and the, the the claim that face mesh was somehow connected to the development of Facebook, it isn't. It wasn't. Just and coincidentally, the, isn't time, the timing was the same, right? Just coincidentally. Huh. It, it was in two thousand three. Okay, and, and this was down right. It, it actually, has nothing to do with it. Put up pictures. Of Um, Zuckerberg does describe the social network as unclear truth, but like I say, right, the uh, voiceover was from his blog. Um, you could say that certain, you know, and I don't see it being taken out of context. It was, you know, read just as he was posting it, you know, uh, date stamped and time stamped uh, as it was. But nonetheless, um, you see there Zuckerberg describing it as a prank. Here, my larger point is, and you see that a healthy 
you know, over a fi- almost a quarter of the class would say, yeah, this is just a prank. This is a no, well, let's apply the no harm, no foul rule here. Here's the problem, right? Just because something is a prank doesn't mean that there might not be legal consequences. Same thing with the, you know, the 11%, you know, I'm inclined to say this had some scientific merit, you know, um, even if it's wrong to judge people based on their looks, you know, um, you know, in fairness, who doesn't judge people based on their looks, you know? So if, you know, if you really care about who the hottest, and maybe it's wrong to care about who the hottest person is, you know, that, okay, I'm willing to entertain and discuss, but if you care about who the hottest person is, you know, but again, even if this was a scientific, you know, even this had, even if this had some validity to it, you know, from a scientific or mathematical, you know, perspective, um, again, doesn't mean that there is not potential legal consequences. So would, let's see what these consequences are. Now, we already did, we looked at private ordering and we saw there, you know, and this is probably why Zuckerberg just got admonished, in my opinion, why he didn't get suspended, let alone expelled, you know, because, you know, the honor code, it doesn't really look like it applies to extracurricular activities. Even this more recent version of the honor code that I've included here, that was strengthened to close some of the loopholes, you know, from the previous version. So, um, uh, you know, we're kind of left of, we're kind of left wondering there, you know, now, uh, really Harvard's interpretation, you know, unless it raises some uh, genuine issue of federal law or constitutional law, it's going to be unreviewable in the court, you know, court, uh, you know, it, you, you know, and, and by the way, this is the important point about private ordering. Let me just go back to this image here, because uh, 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 it's the other reason why I mentioned and begin with private ordering. The reason or the rationale why courts have a general laissez-faire policy, you know, uh, standoff policy, you know, and that the reason why they generally enforce these contracts and these, you know, private ordering rules is that, um, think about it, right? You're not required to go to Harvard, right? I mean, if you apply there, it's probably because you want to go. And if you're lucky enough to get admitted there, you know, you, you're going to go, but you don't have to go to Harvard, even, you know, just because you're admitted there. Same thing with your, um, you know, code of conduct that where you work, right? You're not required to work at, you know, let's say, you know, you work at um, SpaceX, you know, and let's say SpaceX has its own, you know, or Tesla, right? They have their own code of conduct, you know, because you're not required to work at SpaceX, you know, you, ha- you know, you voluntarily agree to their, you know, policies, you know, their company policies, you know? And so, um, and so that's why as a general rule, you know, uh, it's why private ordering is so important. All right. Um, the next source of law, though, is state and local law. And as it happens, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts does have a enacted in statute. A, oops, let me go down. So uh, a little further down here, uh, a general right to privacy. Um, the thing is, though, uh, what does that mean? Right. What is a what does it mean to have a general right to privacy? And here's where our common law tradition in the United States, you know, um, uh, plays an important, you know, an important role, you know, because as I speak in February of 2023, there is no, you know, federal law, general privacy law at the federal level. You know, what we have is basically at the state level, the invasion of privacy tort. So what courts, for example, in Massachusetts and all 49 sister states have done, to some extent, uh, 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 for, to one extent to another, have developed four different ways that privacy can be protected. And what I've done here is I've just summarized it in this graphic. You know, um, this is, you know, I don't want to get too in the weeds here. Like, you know, this is not a bar prep. This is not law school, you know, but I want you to be aware that, you know, there's four different courts or four different forms of invasion of privacy that generate private legal liability. That if somebody invades your privacy, you could hire, you know, uh, prominent, you know, John Morgan, you know, here in Central Florida, or or Dan Newland, you know, prominent attorney to represent you and try to recover money damages, you know, um, from the person or entity invading your privacy. Now, the four forms of privacy you see here are intrusion upon seclusion, appropriation of a, a person's name, likeness, uh, or image, um, public disclosure of private information, and um, um, what's, what lawyers refer to as false light. So let me just explain briefly each of these four forms of invasion of privacy. The first one, intrusion upon seclusion, is the classic one. This is when um, 
sometimes it overlaps with public disclosure of private information or private facts. But intrusion upon seclusion, the idea is that, you know, when you're in your home, for example, um, you have privacy rights. So if somebody, you know, um, or you rent out an Airbnb, and then you find out that the owner or somebody there, previous user, you know, uh, renter, but, but a camera without your consent. That's a clear violation of your seclusion, you know, um, to give you an example. Um, appropriation of, of your name, likeness, or image. That's exactly what it sounds like. Somebody uses your name, image, or likeness without your consent. Um, uh, this private disclosure of private facts, that would be, you know, sensitive information like uh, maybe your, uh, um, your bank account information, perhaps, or a uh, private picture, a naked picture of yourself, that kind of thing. Um, um, and uh, with false light, false light to me is the most fascinating of these four torts, of these four forms of invasion of privacy. False light, uh, what false light is, is when somebody presents information about you out of context to distort the truth. Technically, they're not saying anything false. Technically, they haven't invaded your seclusion, your private seclusion or taken your name or image without your consent or disclosed private information. But here the idea would be like um, uh, uh, false light, um, actually from the movie, you know, uh, The Social Network. It might be true, Erica Albright, you know, what her, uh, you know, you could say the, you know, like, like her measurements. You could say that could be private information um, or you could say that, you know, discussing that even if those measurements are true, you're painting her in a false light, you know, you know, um, and so uh, that's a really uh, a fascinating, uh, fascinating form of protecting, uh, protecting persons uh, privacy. Now, let's see what the class thinks, which of these four is, is, is the, would be the most likely. And you can see that the, the one that got the most vote is appropriation of a person's name, likeness, or image. Problem with that theory, though, and I, this is why you always, you know, this is when we talk about the rule of law, you know, this is why we, you um, you know, um, I I'm going to tell you that the way the courts, not just in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but in the 49 sister states um, that recognize the invasion of privacy, uh, uh, you know, recognize appropriation of name, likeness, or image, you know, without your consent, generally they require commercial use. Generally, the person who's using your name or image without their consent, they have to be making money off of your name, likeness, or image. And, you know, if um, depending on how strict that requirement is enforced in Massachusetts, for example, right, Zuckerberg gets off on a technicality there because the thing about face bash is it's free, right? If anything, it costs Zuckerberg money to post that website. You had to register the domain name. He had to have, you know, um, all the necessary equipment to engage in the hacking activities that he did, right? Um, yeah, he had to, um, you know, uh, probably other costs, you know, his time as well, you know, that can be monetized. And so what's really interesting is, so normally what you see in real life is you'll see people like basically celebrities, like let's say Michael Jordan, you know, or Kim Kardashian. If you use their name, you know, and try to make money off of their name, you're not allowed to do that, you know? And the reason why the court has that commercial use requirement is because maybe you just want to report about Michael Jordan, right? You just, you, you're such a big fan, you know, the other day was Michael Jordan day, right? Um, um, Boom, you know, you just want to, you know, you just want to use his image and put him on, maybe put him on your website or whatever, you know, you're a huge fan of Michael Jordan, for example. Boom, that's okay, because you're not using it for a commercial use, you know, you're not making money off of that, you know. Uh, so notice the, 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 um, the, the tort or the form of invasion of privacy that most people think would be most applicable and common sense would tell you, yeah, appropriation of someone's image without their consent. It's not going to succeed. In fact, I can tell you in real life, a court will probably grant a motion to dismiss at the pleading stage, at the beginning of the case. It'll never get to see a jury. This will probably never even go to discovery, at least under that theory. So what's the second best theory here is going to be intrusion upon seclusion. There, the problem is, it sounds like good, right? You know, these are students, they're, uh, you know, you say they're, they're, they're uh, private photos, but that's the problem, right? The face mash. It was based on... Um, student ID photos, you know? Do you really have a privacy interest in your student ID photo? 
Let me tell you, this is actually a very close question um, because you know this is probably going to depend on if any non-Harvard students accessed the face mash and looked at those pictures. You know, maybe then you could argue it's an intrusion upon seclusion because um, at most your ID photo is meant to be seen by other Harvard students, but not by people beyond the walls of Harvard. And so um, notice the common law, you know, our legal environment, how fact sensitive it is, you know, but that's going to be real tough. If only Harvard students um, were the ones to access the uh, face mash website. And the reason why it got so popular and went viral at the time it did is that, you know, um, Zuckerberg had forwarded the link to some of his friends, you know, to the face mash. And then those friends forwarded the link to other people, and then it went just kept you know spiraling out of control uh, until it was taken down. Um, what about public disclosure of private facts? You saw that got third place here. Um, again, I think that I think that case falls apart because these are not private facts. It's not like Zuckerberg is disclosing you know anyone's phone number or home address, you know, doxing anybody or you know their you know bank account and, or other sensitive information or private pictures, you know. He's posting, he's hacking and posting ID photos, you know? Um, finally, false light. Notice that only got 17%, 37 out of, uh, you know, over 500 students who voted, but maybe false light to the extent that, you know, how accurate are those rankings really, you know? Um, you know, hey, you know, I'm being portrayed here as either hot, you know, or not, not as hot in relation to my fellow students, but maybe that's false light because when I submitted my ID photo to Harvard, I had no idea that a fellow student would use those pictures, you know, would hack the computers at Harvard and then would use my picture so that I could be ranked without my consent. You know what I mean? So actually, I think the false light claim here is actually a pretty strong one. Um, there's one problem though, you're gonna see here, 11% um, of the students said, no, this case falls apart no matter which of the four theories because there's no reasonable expectation of privacy in a student ID photo. I will tell you as a threshold legal matter, you know, if you're going to sue for invasion of privacy, you have to first show that you did have a reasonable expectation of privacy in, you know, whatever it is, whatever picture or information, you know, et cetera, was disclosed without your consent. As a general rule, um, the, re the, the reason for that is that, you know, think about it, right? If you, if somebody takes your picture in a public place, you know, you couldn't have ring cameras, right? You couldn't have surveillance, right? Um, you couldn't have, you know, and, and who knows, maybe that would be a good thing, but the law is very clear. You know, you first have to have a reasonable, and again, this is all judge-made law. This is common law. In order to sue for invasion of privacy, you know, you first have to have a, uh, you know, reasonable expectation of privacy as a general rule. And then you're going to have to show, okay, which of these four do I fall under? Um, and you can see here that Zuckerberg, even though it looks like at first glance, there is a strong argument to be made that there's an invasion of privacy here, you know, in the face mash. When you actually look at the details, you know, how the common law has evolved in this privacy area, um, it's actually not going to be a slam dunk case at all. And I think this is one meaning of what we mean by rule of law, right? That um, we just can't say, oh, because we think it's an invasion of privacy. You know, we're going to sue Zuckerberg for invasion of privacy for face smash and um, recover money damages from him. You know, no, the courts will have to apply the law as it's been developed. And, you know, um, if you can't make out a claim based on, on you know, on the uh, state of the law at the time, your claim fails. You know, um, what about federal law? And it turns out there is a hybrid federal criminal civil statute called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that does make it illegal to obtain information by accessing a computer without authorization, quote unquote, or quote unquote, in excess of authorization. This is important. And you can see here, I've, I've included just a little summary of how broad this law was enacted back in the 1980s and it's been amended many times before. Um, it includes both civil liability and criminal penalties as well. On the civil side, um, you can sue somebody for obtaining your information without authorization, but you have to prove at a minimum $5,000 worth of damages. So, um, you know, you have to have damages in order to sue somebody privately for a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, you know? 
criminally, the feds can come after you. There's no dollar requirement for a criminal case. So it's just obtaining information, you know, uh, by accessing a computer without authorization or an excess of authorization. It has to be a protected computer. Originally, protected computer was defined kind of narrowly, you know, a government computer uh, with classified information, that kind of thing. Now, protected computer is defined broadly to be any computer in interstate commerce. You know, that's basically any computer that has a Wi-Fi, you know, broadband or, you know, internet connection, that kind of thing. So you can see there, section uh, 1030A2 is, uh, subsection A2 is what makes uh, a illegal, a federal crime to access a computer to obtain information without authorization or exceeding authorization, which is, you know, um, that seems to fit the facts of this case. Um, but what's interesting is that Zuckerberg was not prosecuted under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. He was ad boarded, right? He had to suffer some consequences under the private ordering of Harvard College, you know, but he was never criminally charged. And um, um, one reason for that, um, and it's not for lack of publicity, right? This was front page on the Harvard Crimson. Um, those of you in the regular section, the link is in the module. Those of you in my honor section, I'll, I'll include a link to the Harvard Crimson article after class. But what's interesting here is that 81% say that a picture does constitute information. But notice a respectable 19%, almost one fifth of the class would say that no, a picture is not information. And this raises an interesting rule of law problem. Interesting rule of law problem. What happens when the statute does not define a term? You know, what happens if the term information is not defined? Again, I will tell you in our legal environment, we fall back on judge-made law. A judge would have to interpret the meaning of information, you know, um, under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And what I want to do here is, before we do our last survey question and uh, conclude today's uh, lecture, I just want to share with you, um, I don't have a slide on this, so I'll just go ahead and end this, uh, the, uh, the screen share for a moment. I just want to share with you the two main um, theories of interpret. Now, this will be a somewhat of an oversimplification, um, but I'll share with you the two, for the purposes of this survey introductory course, the two main schools of interpretation that judges generally use when there is a question of interpreting a law, you know, like information. Does that include a picture? You know, because um, one could argue if I'm Zuckerberg's defense attorney, I'm going to argue that no, if this statute was designed originally, well, let's look at the two schools of uh, uh, interpretation. Um, um, one is going to be um, what's often referred to as textualism. Textualism simply means is you look at the words of the statute, look at the words of the law as it as it's enact as it was enacted, and then the courts just apply the ordinary public meaning of those words, you know, as it was understood. Um, here, there's a debate, you know, uh, do you do do courts apply the public meaning of the word information when that law was enacted originally in 1984? Or because the law has been amended multiple times, I believe as late as, you know, um, 2010, you know, um, you know, what does the word information mean? But one school of thought, and by the way, doesn't matter whether you are, you know, um, there's a big discussion right now because, you know, a whole bunch of conservative judges on the Supreme Court somehow overruled, you know, after 50 years, uh, uh, Roe versus Wade. Um, you know, and there's, uh, you know, cadre of more liberal progressive justices, you know, judges who would have, uh, you know, protected the uh, uh, abortion rights. And so, but, you know, both liberal and conservative justices say if the words of the statute are clear, you normally apply the statute, you know, because that's what Congress is for. Um, however, where justices often and judges will often disagree is, well, how do we know the words are clear? Like the word information, right? It sounds like that's a pretty clear, you know, um, obtaining information, you know, by accessing a computer without authorization or exceeding authorization. That sounds clear, but, you know, what does information mean? Does that include a picture? If there is some debate, some discussion about if the statute is ambiguous, then judges often will look at what's called the pragmatic, they'll do the pragmatic theory of interpretation or the purposes, uh, purposeful theory of interpretation, where we look at, okay, 
what is the purpose of the law? Why was that law enacted in the first place? What problem was it designed to solve? And then, you know, if you're Mark Zuckerberg, you could argue, yeah, this word information, it's ambiguous, you know? And so we need to look at the purpose of the statute. And when Congress enacted the statute in the 1980s, they really meant to protect government computers, right? If I'm a government lawyer, if I'm the prosecutor here, uh, US attorney, I'm gonna argue to the contrary that no, the word information is clear, you know what I mean? Um, um, uh, going back to 1948 and Claude Shannon's most famous paper, The Theory of Information, you know, uh, information is anything that can be, you know, put on the internet, uh, has an information content, you know, including a picture. So we don't need to go to the why Congress enacted the statute. But Your Honor, if we are going to look at why Congress enacted the statute, yes, in the 1980s, it was enacted in order to protect, you know, government computers. But it has, that law has since been amended many times to protect all computers, you know, that have connection to the internet. And so um, given how important computers and the internet are to our daily lives. And so, um, you know, is a smartphone a computer for purposes of the law, right? I mean, come on, is that ambiguous? Um, uh, you know, computers, anything that can process information and information is anything that can be processed, right? And so um, let's use our common sense here. Let's look at the spirit of the law. It's designed, the law was enacted to, to fight hacking, right? So we wanna define hacking as broadly as possible. So notice, right? And that's something that the courts would have to decide the correct interpretation, you know, by either looking at the text of the statute or looking at the purpose of the statute, why it was enacted or some combination of the two. I will say um, both theories of interpretation and this is really important when we talk about the rule of law, right? Um, both theories of interpretations have pros and cons. The textual theory, you know, sounds like it's good, you know, like the courts, you know, hey, we're not gonna make things up. We're just gonna interpret the words as Congress enacted it, you know? Uh, um, and otherwise, you know, we would be making law, not interpreting law. Problem with that is sometimes statutes are in fact ambiguous, you know? Sometimes you, there is a genuine question, you know, is a smartphone a computer, you know, for purposes of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act? Is a picture information for purposes of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act? Um, so um, when there's an ambiguity, now the problem with the purpose, purpose theory is gonna be that sometimes a law will have multiple purposes and sometimes those purposes can be in conflict. All right, let me do continue with the screen share and let's look at international law, our last main sources, uh, last main source of law. Oh, by the way, here the survey results. What does the class? Oh, yeah, we did look at the results. So the class would say, yeah, common sense, a picture um, does fall under the definition of information. But notice, right? we'd actually have to look up the statute and see how information is defined and then take it from there. Um, so I wanna say that even here, Zuckerberg has a fighting chance. And it's probably one reason why he wasn't prosecuted, right? Um, in that um, one could argue whether student ID photos really falls under that definition. There, the argument is probably less strong, but it's a plausible argument. Finally, we have international law and this is sort of our a last major source of law. International law is so interesting because sometimes there just is no international law, you know. Um, but here, when it comes to cybercrime, there's something called the Budapest Convention, the treaty, cybercrime treaty. And it was, um, um, it was actually um, joined by the United States, um, I believe in 2008. So it was after the face smash incident. Um, but technically now it's part of our law. One of the things I want to show you, though, and this is the most inter interesting thing about treaties, I'll show it to you on this screen share, and I'm sorry the map is so small here. Um, let me see if there's any way of making it larger. Uh, no, no, when I try to make the screen bigger, it, uh, it, let me see, you know, uh, I think that's as big as I can make it. You can see that um, about almost half the countries in the world have joined the Budapest Treaty, but what you're going to see is two important countries have not joined it, and that is the People's Republic of China and um, the Russian Federation, Russia, uh, have not joined the Budapest Convention. And I mentioned this because I don't know how many of you, uh, my fellow UCF students, um, went to, I think the FBI went on campus last semester, the Tampa division, and they had a cybercrime uh, seminar. And they mentioned how, um, 
going back a number of years, but also the Biden administration, the Department of Justice uh, under Merrick Garland, they have issued and unsealed indictments against members of the Russian and Chinese military, high ranking government officials, military officials of, um, you know, a, a hacking of violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So you could see why um, Russia and China may not want to join the Budapest Treaty, because then, you know, as part of the treaty, they would have to agree to extradite, you know, uh, uh, anybody in a sister country that's joined the treaty. Um, you know, uh, if somebody in a sister country is uh, one of their nationals are accused of, uh, you know, breaking uh, the law, you know, the treaty would have, you know, they would have to comply with the treaty and facilitate that extra extradition. Um, that is the most interesting aspect I want you to know about international law. The voluntary nature. It's kind of like private ordering, right? You don't have to join Facebook. And if you don't, the content moderation policies don't apply to you. It's same thing with the treaty, right? You don't have to join the Budapest Convention if you're a country. But if you do, that treaty becomes part of your domestic law. Okay, given that background, and given that there is a Budapest Treaty, let's just imagine that uh, the treaty was ratified, you know, at, before the face mash incident. Really, the treaty doesn't apply to face mash because it was ratified. Even though the treaty was negotiated in 2002, the United States did not ratify it until many years later. And then the, um, the, um, the face mash incident occurred in 2003. So here, it's really a two-part question is I've included the definition of cyber violence. One of the interesting things of the Budapest Treaty is that it makes it an international crime to in, you know, put out hate speech on the internet. And part of this, you have to understand that the Budapest Treaty was initially, um, initially negotiated by the members of the, uh, I believe 22 member states of the European Union at the time. And you have to understand that in Europe, countries like France and Germany, and actually a whole bunch of countries, you know, um, you know, uh, during World War II, um, a lot of innocent civilians, you know, either of the Jewish faith or because they were gypsies or because they were gay, they were Germany, you know, and uh, uh, Hitler's evil regime took these people and put them in uh, on trains into concentration camps, you know. And so in Europe, actually, you know. Uh, free speech, you are not free to, you know, to post on the internet that the Holocaust did not exist, you know, to deny the Holocaust. You're not, in fact, you could go to jail for that. And so um, the European Union has a very, uh, the European, uh, this Budapest Treaty, which is, you know, under the umbrella of European law, you know what I mean? Uh, and the background of the Holocaust and genocide generally, you know, uh, and because of the dangers of hate speech, you know, makes cyber violence, you know, an international offense, if you will. Um, and so the question is, is face mash a form of cyber violence? Like here Zuckerberg lucked out because this treaty had not been ratified by the US back in 2003. But had it had been, could Zuckerberg, and, and I say this because this is not some idle, I know for a fact, this is not an idle threat, you know, I know for a fact, you know, um, uh, President Obama's uh, daughter, uh, eldest daughter go, uh, 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 went to Harvard. I know for a fact, um, members of the uh, of the royal family, children of the royal family of um, the King of Jordan um, and Queen Noor of Jordan have gone to Harvard. And, you know, children of other powerful people in other powerful countries have gone to Harvard. And um, Jordan, for example, for example, the Kingdom of Jordan has joined the Budapest Convention, you know, and one could imagine, you know, maybe, you know, if you piss off some powerful people, you know, um, by going after their children, you know, maybe, you know, uh, you could potentially be extradited to that country for engaging in cyber violence, you know, if you fall under the definition. Uh, so what's interesting here is um, if we look at the first uh, part of the question, um, yes, 31 plus 42 percent. So uh, a whopping almost three quarters of the class would say that face mash constitutes cyber violence. And I will tell you, as I've conducted the survey over the years, that number gets higher and higher, especially after the B2 movement, the whole Harvey Weinstein, you know, now that a lot of people, more people are aware of what a terrible problem, you know, uh, um, sexual harassment and sexual assault in a lot of different industries, you know, beginning with the entertainment industry. And so, um, you know, you look at face match, especially, especially what Zuckerberg wrote about Erica Albright, we don't know her real name, but that looks like, yeah, 
that could very well fall under the cyber violence, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, provision had this treaty been in force at the time in the United States. My second question, though, is kind of interesting. Even if a smash is cyber violence, what about free speech? Isn't this a violation of, you know, how can the United States join a treaty when the treaty contains provisions that seem to be inconsistent with our First Amendment tradition? Let's see what the class thinks here. And for here, we have to look at the yes answers for number two. So you have to add up 11% and 31% gives us 52. So we have a 52, 48, much closer, almost a 50, 50 split as to whether the cybercrime convention, um, I will tell you as a matter of um, at least the way the United States Supreme Court has interpreted the first amendment, you know, historically speaking, this is both conservative and liberal judges on the Supreme Court. Um, um, they normally, you know, Normally, um, hate speech is technically speaking protected speech. You know, the only time um, hate speech could arguably be criminalized or punished by the government is when it's hate speech is accompanied with an imminent threat of physical violence. So the court has been really narrowed down. There's just a few narrow categories of unprotected speech, things like defamation, making a false statement about somebody, you know. Um, uh, things like perjury, making a false statement in a court of law or an official proceeding. We'll see if Donald Trump gets accused of uh, perjury, you know, uh, after the whole January 6th committee. Um, 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 child pornography, although pornography is generally protected speech, but child pornography, uh, you, you, you know, can be criminalized according to the U.S. Supreme Court. But what cannot be criminal, and then threats of, of physical violence, imminent threats of physical violence, you know. So notice under existing Supreme Court jurisprudence, you know, um, one could argue that the Budapest Convention, if ever anybody got prosecuted for cyber violence, you know, in the United States, um, probably that's going to go up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court would have to decide if that cyber violence provision in the treaty, whether it is consistent with the First Amendment, and if not, whether the whole treaty falls or whether that particular provision can be just cut off, you know, uh, the severability of that provision. That's something that would have to be decided by a court if this ever became an issue. Now, I wanna conclude on this note by going back to our first survey question. Um, remember when I asked about what social media platform you use the most? So I'm sorry, my screen just went blank. Oh, here we go. Um, um, this is the debate right now that's going on. No, I'm trying to make this as big as possible. Um, this is the debate that's going on right now. You know, some people think that because we, we're dealing with the digital public square, that the First Amendment should apply to social media sites, you know. But there I say to you, and that's the debate going on in Congress right now. There I say to you, be careful what you wish for, because if the First Amendment does apply to, you know, if it overrules private ordering, you know, and the general rule is that it normally doesn't, you know, but if a court, if the Supreme Court were to rule that it does, then, you know, all of these websites would not be able to enforce their content moderation policies to prohibit hate speech, you know, um, and other offensive speech. Yeah, they could prohibit child pornography. Yeah, they could prohibit defamation and, you know, perjury really wouldn't apply there. Um, but, you know, they could prohibit the other uh, unprotected categories of speech, but they would have to allow everything. So everything would, would become more like Twitter, you know, where you could say whatever you want. And even Twitter, Elon Musk has still been censoring, you know, especially journalists that he doesn't like. So um, uh, so I always say, be careful what you wish for, and we'll see what happens moving forward. That's really a policy issue. I can see the argument for saying that this is the digital public square. So we have to allow, you know, we should extend the First Amendment to social media platforms. But if you do extend the First Amendment to social media platforms, you're basically now, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, not allowing these companies to enforce their content moderation policies. Of course, that could be good, you know, depending on your point of view, or that could be bad because you see more hate speech and more, you know, uh, of, the, of this uh, uh, forms of speech on the internet. All right, with this, what I'm going to do is um, uh, uh, takeaways. Um, the, the most important takeaway here, right, if you ever get sued or you feel that somebody has violated your rights, you really need an attorney, right? You really need an attorney to help you navigate what are the private ordering rules that are applicable, you know, and whether they can be challenged in court. 
what are the relevant state and local laws that might apply, what federal laws might apply, and what international obligations might apply. Second of all, uh, takeaway is now you've seen. That's a good summary of the main sources of law. When we say rule of law, that's what we mean. Those main sources of law, beginning with private ordering, state and local, federal, and of course, international. Um, and then finally, I think this is probably the most important lesson, that the relationship between law and morality is not an obvious one. Even if you thought that this website was a prank, right? Um, no harm, no foul. It could still generate you know, legal liability issues, you know? And likewise, um, even if you were outraged by this website, you know, it's morally wrong and morally repugnant to judge people based on their looks. And even though we do that every day, it's one thing for you and I to do that, you know, for the two or three new people we meet each day, it's quite another, you know, to do it on the internet where it's all scalable and you could be rating thousands of people each day, you know? Um, even if you thought it was morally offensive, it doesn't mean that it was illegal. Right. So, you know, there's an asymmetry here between law and morality. And that's really the larger lesson and is why going back to the first point, you always need to consult a lawyer. Um, that said, right, largely speaking, you would think the law should broadly reflect what our moral values are. But in a pluralistic and, you know, multi-dimensional society like the U.S., right, where you have people from all over the world, right, speaking many different languages with many different religious and moral beliefs. Sometimes, you know, we have different understandings of what's moral, and that's where the law and rule of law come into play. All right, with that, um, I will wish everybody a good day, and I will stop the recording.